Hi, everybody. I'm Bob Collum, and welcome to this next edition of Human Landing Site Study Hangouts, or HLS2 Hangouts, a joint uh, presentation by NASA's Human Exploration Operations Mission Directorate and the Science Mission Directorate here at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. Today's briefing on humans will ex how humans will accelerate life detection on Mars, part two, builds on the conversations that started at the first human landing site workshop for human missions to the surface of Mars, which was held in October 2015 in Houston, Texas. Before I introduce today's presenters, let's get to know our HLS2 steering committee co-chairs, Ben Bussey and Rick Davis. Ben, who is currently on vacation, is chief exploration scientist in NASA's Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate. And Rick is the assistant director for science and exploration in NASA's Science Mission Directorate. Rick, any words? Uh, no, unfortunately, Ben is on vacation and couldn't be here, so I'm filling in for both of us. But uh, we really thank everybody uh, for coming and doing this part two, because this is really a critical discussion as we look um, towards some human beings to Mars and figuring out how we really utilize them uh, yeah, and maximize the science we get. Finding life is probably one of the coolest things we can even imagine. So uh, many thanks to the team here for coming in and talking in the second part. Thank you, Rick. Now let's introduce our presenters. Joining us from Ames Research Center in California, we have Chris McKay. Chris is an astrobiologist in the Space Science Division at Ames and will focus on life detection, the importance of this for humans on Mars, and advantages humans will bring to the search and how they will carry it out. Hi, Chris. Joining us from Johnson Space Flight Center in Texas, we have Paul Niles. Paul is a planetary scientist who will discuss the role of humans and robots with regard to geological fieldwork and how new technologies create large amounts of data that are difficult to process tactically. He will also address different types of robotic explorers that may support a human mission. Hi, Paul. Hi. And joining us at NASA headquarters, we have Andy Spry, Brian Glass, and Jen Eigenbrod. Andy is a senior scientist at the SETI Institute and consultant to the Office of Planetary Protection. He will, Hi, he will discuss why we need to control microbial hitchhikers as we explore. Brian is a planetary scientist who will address drilling and relative productivity in geologic surveying by a remotely commanded rover versus a space-suited human versus a geologist in shirt sleeves based on analog studies. <laughs> I'm Brian. Hi, and Jen is an astrobiologist in the Planetary Environments Lab at Goddard Space Flight Center. We'll address where we might look for life, extinct and extinct, and examples of instruments astronauts and rovers might use to find and understand it. Hi, Jen. Yeah. Uh, feel free to ask any questions for the presenters in the live chat on our YouTube page, and we'll answer them during the stream. And with that, uh, let's jump right in. So over to you, Chris. Okay, great. Uh, thanks. Let's let's go ahead and post up the slides, um, and hopefully our viewers, our participants, can see that. Uh, what I want to talk about is the role of humans in life detection, and this is a this is picture is a good example. This shows a scientist. I think it's Mary Beth Wilhelm from here at Ames in the middle of the Atacama Desert, which is one of the most Mars-like places on Earth in terms of its dryness, and this is a place where we can test the role of instruments and the role of humans in searching for life in environments where life is hard to find. Uh, let's go to the next slide and talk a little bit about uh, how we would do life detection on future missions or why we would do that. First, I think it's important to understand that life detection is in a key intrinsic science question. Is there, or was there life on Mars? Is it a second genesis? How does it relate to life on Earth? These are questions about the nature of life, the nature of the universe, the nature of how we got here on Earth. These are important science questions. But the next bullet points out that life, the life question on Mars is also important for astronaut health and safety. Uh, if we're going to send humans to Mars, we want to know they're not going to catch Martian measles or something like that. Uh, and that the criteria for testing and validating for astronaut health and safety may be different and may be more, more, uh, more advanced than the criteria for science alone. And finally, even more severe will be criteria for returning things to Earth. Not just astronauts, which we NASA plan certainly for their return to Earth, but even just uh, chunks of rock and dirt, maybe on a sample return mission. Before we bring something back to Earth, we must understand whether it has life in it and how to deal with it. 
And this is not just a NASA rule. This is mandated by planetary protection, as you'll hear more about from Andy, by international treaty. So there's lots of reasons for doing life detection. Science, astronaut health, return to Earth. Next slide. Talks about how we would do it. Um, the only life detection experiment we've ever done was Viking 40 years ago, and it was based on trying to search for metabolism. Metabolism was what organisms do when they eat. So we basically were asking the question, is there anything in the soil that will eat the nutrients that we pour in on the soil? Well, we wouldn't do it that way now. That's a kind of a crude way to search for life, and it only searches for things that are actually alive and that are willing to eat what you give them. Uh, instead, now the focus on life detection is looking for the biomolecular structures that life makes. For example, the homochiral amino acids and proteins. All the proteins in life are that all, all the proteins in life are made out of amino acids that are left-handed. And that distinct selectivity is a unique signature of life. And there's also distinct patterns in lipids. And Jen Eigenbrod is one of the world's authorities on both of these topics and probably talk about them later. Uh, another point here is that we have instruments that are ready to go. Uh, the biggest challenge, in fact, is probably collecting a sample and processing. And you'll hear more about that. And then, as Jen will discuss, where do we go uh, to search for these samples is key. It's clear that Mars is a diverse planet. Some sites are going to be more interesting for life than others. This is just what we see on Earth. If you were coming to Earth, uh, where you go would matter on how much life you see. Next slide, please. Uh, the next slide is, is the last slide in this early talk here, and it focuses on what are the roles of humans? What can humans do in life detection? How will life detection affect humans? So the role goes both ways. Uh, first, one of the key abilities that humans bring is the ability to operate deep drilling equipment. Every, just about every study that's looked at how humans can advance science on Mars focuses in on deep drilling as a capability that's enabled or enhanced by having humans there. And Brian will, will talk about that. He's one of the agency's experts on drilling uh, on Mars. Uh, the other thing that humans will do, because uh, sending humans to Mars is such a big operation, it will certainly have an onboard laboratory. And part of that will be, for example, the medical room, just to treat the astronauts. So there will be a, a necessary set of equipment and laboratory capabilities that will go with humans that wouldn't necessarily be there with a robotic mission. Uh, and that laboratory can be used in the search for life. And with humans and with a laboratory, we could do iterative, adaptive exploration. We could find something and then discover it, study it, and then follow up on that. So we could get a lot more done a lot faster. And the last bullet turns the situation around. Once we send humans to Mars, they will be de facto test subjects. They will be guinea pigs. They're going to be in the environment. They're going to be interacting with the dirt. They'll be interacting with any biological agents that are there. Uh, so monitoring their response will be an important experiment all by itself. Uh, and whether they like it or not, the astronauts will be uh, subjecting, subjected to this new and different environment, and their response will be of keen interest, not just medically, but also scientifically in terms of understanding life on Mars. So that's a quick overview of the search for life and the role of humans, and I think that was my last slide, uh, Bob, and so pass it on to the next presenter. All right, which I believe is Andy Spry joining us here. Andy, if you want to start us off on managing microbes. Sure. So managing microbes, I, I put together a slide packet, a uh, couple of topics I want to cover. Um, just to look at the microbial abundance and diversity and the problem that represents, um, but also uh, you know, the opportunity if there is a, a Martian uh, ecosystem also, that's kind of the thing we're looking for. We don't want to mix the two up. So um, that's that. And then I'm going to look at some concepts in zoning how we keep those uh, activities separate, uh, a potential impact on uh, terrestrial microbes on the exploration activity, and what we need to find out to protect against that outcome so that we can actually get the humans there with their greater capabilities of being effective in the exploration role. So um, in robotic systems, what we've actually done is, you know, in sending robotic systems, Mars, Viking, the Pathfinder, MERs, uh, and, and uh, curiosity, 
we've limited the number of microbes we send on the spacecraft by cleaning the spacecraft and sterilizing elements of the spacecraft. You can't do that with people, and the crew themselves have their own uh, microorganisms present naturally and the habitats that they live in, uh, many, uh, many more, and the capability to breed more. Just the fact that you have a moist environment that humans can breathe the air in means that you're also going to carry along with you microorganisms. And that there's a scale issue with that. So just to put that in perspective, um, if you converted all the organisms that are allowed to be on a robotic spacecraft into people, that would be about the population of a small town somewhere like Reno, Nevada or something like that. But if you converted all the um, microbes that are in a, a human into people, that would be by comparison on the same scale, something like 10 times the population of the whole Earth. Okay, so you have this <laughs> scaling issue when you send uh, humans um, to the surface of Mars, it's just a paradigm shift uh, relative to doing plant for robotic exploration. So next slide, please. So as, as well as the sheer numbers, you also have the diversity of uh, microorganisms. Just on the left of this slide, um, there is a representation of the tree of life. And uh, if you look to the um, bottom right corner, it's kind of a complex, um, small diagram, but the bottom right corner is where we sit along with the fungi and the plants. Um, and everything else is a microorganism and their diversity there is represented by their, uh, the difference in their genomes. And the difference in genomes, the ability to code uh, proteins uh, is related to the, the ability to do different kinds of metabolic tricks um, to uh, sustain life. And that uh, impacts the ability to live in these uh, diverse places here on Earth and elsewhere. And when you look in the uh, JPL clean rooms, uh, you see the top right there is a, a cleaning of the MER um, outer uh, aeroshell. Um, what we find is something like uh, the representation seen in the pie chart on the bottom right side of that chart, where you have a, a collection of organisms you see. Some are very abundant, then less so, then less so, then extremely rare. But we never get to the point where we can say that organism will never be there. It's just a, a numbers game, and, and we want to be careful about uh, what it is and who it is and what their capabilities are um, that we'd send to Mars. We can get uh, an, a passenger list, if you like, but we can't yet uh, determine the capabilities of all the organisms that might be present to say there is some risk or no risk or, or an unacceptable level of risk. We, unacceptable level of risk will be the sort of kind of going in position. So um, with that in mind, um, what we would like to do uh, as we explore is to be able to determine, next slide. Uh, a quick question on mm -hmm. that, the last subject. Um, have, how do, do we know whether or not the, the microorganisms that inhabit the human body would be able to survive on Mars? Have we done the analog tests on the ISS or? Not definitively so, but there are, there are certain organisms that have been studied, and uh, one of the organisms that's been uh, looked at by uh, a researcher called Andy Sugar, based at, uh, in Florida, um, is actually a, a microorganism which you would typically find uh, in, in the cavities of your mouth, and that will survive on the, uh, on the surface of Mars based on the barometric pressure uh, and the water availability and the, the general ambient environment, with the exception of uh, resistance to UV uh, exposure at a high level. So the, the surface of Mars, if you're just sitting there on the surface, is not very friendly to uh, terrestrial life. But if you're protected underneath a, uh, underneath, uh, a grain of dust or um, you know, in, in a remote cavity on, on a, a spacecraft, then, then you may be able to um, stay there just dormant for a long time you know, relative to the lifespan of a human, just sit there for a long time. Uh, and, and the threat is therefore there for contamination down the road. A quick follow-up on that. Um, do, do you feel like we understand the microbes that inhabit the human body enough that we could say, oh, we found this microbe, but that's definitely from you know, astronaut day. Uh, astronaut Dave has a microbiome, uh, and that will change over time. So one of the things that we're finding with the uh, the astronaut microbiome study is that, uh, you know, for example, with that uh, the Kelly twins, that actually their microbiomes change over time 
but they change differently according to whether you're here on Earth or whether you're in, in a, a, in a uh, constrained environment like the, the ISS. So um, we really are only just getting a handle on, on how uh, microbial diversity within an individual um, changes over time. Um, you know, we've only you know, it's, it's, it's within living memory that we didn't know what the human genome was. And without, you know, without those tools, we couldn't figure out what the human microbiome was. And we're only just getting to grips with the, the spectrum of diversity of organisms associated with humans and, and health and sickness and uh, the links to um, you know, what organisms are capable of doing. So, so that's all new science that we're um, still researching here on Earth and how we um, take that forward to uh, what will happen when we're exploring Mars is, is an area which we're going to have to study, and I'll refer to that later, is that what happens to um, the microbiome that we launch that then transfers to Mars, becomes part of the habitat environment, how, you know, what are the different selective pressures that uh, favor a particular organism over another organism, and will that be a problem? either for the health and safety of the astronauts, the functioning of the equipment, or the Mars environment itself if they're released. So those are all unanswered questions. I'm kind of getting ahead on my own slide, but that's okay. So um, the, the next slide, looking at the crude uh, exploration concept, and one thing we want to be able to do um, is to uh, um, have the human assets there with their capability to traverse, uh, and uh, but not to have that um, either impact the human, the health of the astronauts or the, the Mars environment. So we want to be able to define something like a safe zone. Uh, you can see there in the uh, mark, there's the ellipse on the, the right, the, the left-hand side uh, of the slide. And, and that, that is um, showing a separation of crude activities inside the ellipse from regions on Mars where either terrestrial life might get to, the crew might transfer and contaminate them, or um, or where Martian life itself might be that we don't want the crew to be contaminated by. Uh, and so, so that, that ellipse defines, if you like, a safe zone where release doesn't matter and, and Mars uh, is not a problem. So we need to understand that two-way street. And uh, generically, the Mars environment is hostile to terrestrial life. So it, it, it's reasonable that at the surface we'll be able to define a place like that. And Andy, if I might, can you talk a little bit about our knowledge of transport? Um, on Mars in terms of if you have microbial releases, how well we know that? Sure, so um, the, the UV environment on Mars will, um, uh, as I said previously, in fact, it's effectively it's, it's lethal in the time frame of uh, minutes to hours for a, an organism sitting on the surface. What we really don't have a good handle on is you know, if that organism is protected uh, in some way, for example, inside a, a inside a dust particle, or you know, other, otherwise protected. For example, if it's a colony of organisms, uh, as a cluster, the guy on the inside, a bit like ants in a river, right? The guy on the inside is okay. The guys on the outside are getting hammered but, uh, <laughs> by the UV radiation, but the guy on the inside may be okay. And and particles of sort of um, you know many microns may allow an organism to be present and viable for some period of time. I think that the, there's not much work has been done in this area, but I think the kind of threshold for the uh, kind of effect of protection is as small as three microns. That's uh, some work um, done by uh, Wayne Nicholson um, some time ago. It's precursor work for uh, another activity. But um, you know, there is a potential for a particle that has a viable organism in it to be transferred to a remote site. And over what time period, we uh, don't really understand the, the weather at the sort of very local level well enough, the wind temperature, to be able to predict how, how that will be. And I'll talk about that, the impact on that uh, just shortly on, on the, our exploration. Uh, but you know, the, the intent is that we get to a place where we can have a safe zone and uh, an operation activity that might have a clean rover station of the kind that, that, that um, Chris alluded to and Brian's going to talk about. Um, and, and, you know, basically a partitioning uh, of the crude activities from the robotic activities and places in Mars that we don't, places on Mars that we don't understand very well. Next slide. Please. 
So that's the that's the um, concept of uh, uh, an expiration, a crude expiration. So, so the other slide, the other zoning concept is is what folk may be familiar with from the the, um, the, the expiration zones um, workshop in 2015 that led to this series of uh, of uh, activities, uh, and that's the one of uh, a 100 kilometer radius kind of um, zone that would have the um, place where humans live roughly towards the center, and then the capability, the zone itself will be defined by the exploration capabilities of the equipment that they will be taking with them. Uh, and inside that, that uh, zone would be uh, sufficient resources to meet the, the, the exp expedition's um, needs, in, in, for example, in terms of oxygen generation, rocket fuel generation, uh, but also sufficient interesting sites for them to go and explore in the course of their, um, uh, their time on the surface. So um, notice the scale. It, it is that you know, many kilometers scale, but we don't yet know the scale for the safe zone that I was describing earlier. So, so if you put, put the next slide on, it might be that the safe zone you know, is only a couple of kilometers and outside that um, we have a reasonable expectation that terrestrial contamination will not be able to travel or not be able to uh, establish itself. And so if that's the case, things can proceed as normal or as planned, if you were. You know, we, we can actually set up the, uh, the exploration uh, task to uh, run based on the ISU, ISRU activities that are planned and the science uh, sites of interest that are planned. Next slide. However, if the safe zone gets to be too large, if we if we find that in our pre previous studies that um, the uh, spread of terrestrial contamination from the astronauts' activity or from the, the um, presence of the habitat, um, then it may start to interfere with um, you know we. we might end up contaminating ISRU sites. We might end up contaminating um, sites of uh, scientific interest so that it becomes difficult to discriminate between whether a, a carbon signature or a biosignature bio that you would uh, detect on, on the Martian surface at that site of interest is not something that's blown there from, from the habitat that we're essentially detecting Florida when we thought we were detecting Mars. So, um, we have a set of knowledge gaps on you know, how, how do we deal with terrestrial biology in the setting of, of a, a crude exploration. So we need to know a bit more about what happens to Earth microbes on Mars. Um, how well do they survive? Are there these um, sort of uh, apocalyptic scenarios or is that really just not credible? Um, where do they go? So we need to know more about the, um, the local um, situations at the, when, uh, at the Martian surface, not just as we have been able to measure from orbit, the, the sort of climate and the present day climate that we call weather at the orbital level, um, but right down at the, what's the prevailing wind direction at the site of the activity, at the site of the habitat. If you've actually driven off somewhere in a pressurized vehicle, What's the wind like there? And what's going to happen with what is shed from that environment, uh, the, the contaminants that uh, we know are going to leak from uh, the, the crude systems? Um, where does that go? So we need to know that uh, level of detail. And, and the flip side of that, how well do our systems perform at, at preventing those leaks? And how much work do we need to uh, put and effort and time and um, uh, funding needs to be deployed to making sure that things don't leak beyond a particular level. And that's kind of a push to pull you. And in amongst all that, uh, you have the need to be able to monitor what are the um, current situation um, versus the permissible limits for the, um, for the parameters that you've established for your activity um, and, and what is normal and abnormal from the, the Point of view of protecting Mars, but also from the point of view of protecting health, from the point of view of protecting the water purification system, from the point of view of protecting the uh, capability to process waste. All those things uh, become uh, part of the knowledge acquisition that we need to do uh, in, in the um, time frame. So, um, and, and, uh, 
that's kind of the, the point I wanted to make. And when we can do all those things, we'll be able to uh, explore Mars, understand it, uh, and then avoid the scenario that we somehow contaminated or degraded it beyond a point where it becomes useful to us to explore in the future. A, a follow-up on those knowledge gaps. Uh, how would we test uh, the, the viability of organisms on the Martian surface short of just you know, landing a, a bunch of organisms on the on the Martian surface. So, so we do have quite good capabilities to to model most parameters of the, the uh, Martian environment. The one that we don't have, we, we can't really model gravity very easily. Uh, but the radiation environment, the UV environment, um, the, the, there is certainly a, a, an ability to acquire more knowledge about the um, the. the Geochemical environment by, for example, you know, the, the ability to interrogate um, rocks at Mars is limited by the instruments you can ship there. It would be much better if we had a sample uh, here that we can look at with all of the capabilities of, of uh, terrestrial um, labor analysis laboratories um, to be able to say, well, there's these different uh, chemicals present which are. Uh, either a food source for terrestrial organisms of a particular genre, or or they're lethal to them at a particular concentration. You know, and, and try and build a picture of um, what Mars is going to be like when we do have these organisms there of whatever abundance is, um, to to the extent that we can you know, deal with it and credibly say we are not going to ruin Mars for future generations by our exploration activity. Uh, you did say that we currently launched spacecraft with the, I think you said the population of Reno. Yeah, um, about, uh, about 300,000. I, I missed that. <laughs> yeah. But um, is there any way we can observe, you know, like existing spacecraft on Mars to understand the, how microbes have survived on well, Mars? It, well, yeah, it, it's theoretically possible, but then you've got to have a mission to go back. Um, or, you know, or a, a, an element which is taken and then brought back. It's cer certainly feasible. But, you know, we can do many of these things uh, without the risk of um, sending something which we might regret later. Uh, well, thank you, Andy. And I think with that, we're over to Paul. So, Paul, if you want to take us away. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so, I'm going to talk to you all about um, robots and humans and how we can use them together. To hopefully in, utilize our effectiveness um, to do a much better job of uh, of doing. I'm sorry, this is not a slide I thought I sent, but okay. Um, anyway, um, this this will work. So so basically, we want to know how can we use utilize robots so that we can explore Mars more effectively. Um, and accomplish more scientific objectives while we're there. So we want to increase the efficiency of the human exploration at the surface uh, by using the uh, our robotic assistance. Um, and if you think about sort of the history of human exploration of planetary surfaces, um, you know, 50 years ago, we we didn't really have as much um, capability as we have now. And so, how can we utilize the capability that we've developed over the last 50 years to um, to enhance our ability to explore Mars. Um, so we have a pretty good understanding of, of operating Mar uh, rovers and robots on Mars uh, from Earth using high latency um, commands from, from the Earth. Uh, but when you have humans now in the loop and on the surface, uh, that opens up a whole new range of different kinds of concepts of operations. Um, and uh, we see different models for for this at the ISS, um, oil rig repairs in, in uh, underneath the ocean, and uh, tele-operated um, surgical techniques. So, so we're in the process of trying to figure out exactly how we can model the interaction of humans and robots, uh, and what the, what a concept of operations we want to use on the surface um, in the future. So, next slide. Um, so, crew and robots would have several styles of interaction. Um, the, uh, there could be, you can imagine a lot of different um, possible um, 
combinations in. And so one thing could be that uh, crew, crew, the, the robots do uh, tasks that are pretty much uh, maintained from Earth. So, so they work independently. Um, so that the robots are mostly handled by um, scientists on Earth, while and scientists and engineers on Earth, while the crew does their own thing and they exchange data as they go. Um, the other possibility is that you can use robots in advance of a crew uh, landing and then or or after the crew leaves. Um, and then then you also have the, the possibility that the crew and the robots work together um, in a concert. And uh, and so these are all different you know types uh, of concept of operations we might we might address. Um, and then the other thing that you think have to think about is what are the kinds of scientific or what are the kind of objectives that you are trying to reach? And it might turn out that different mixtures of um, robotic crew interaction provide different uh, are, are better suited for different objectives. So in particular, with regard to life detection, um, the, well, the idea of a robot that is specially sterilized so that or cleaned so that it can uh, explore a special region on Mars or a place where we expect there to be the possibility of life or presence of liquid water, um, that that would be a, a interesting way of attacking that problem, but that may not be useful for other kinds of scientific investigations. And Paul, um, we have a question from Eric Heller. He's asking about, um, when you say robots, he's asking specifically about aerial robots as well. Yeah, yeah. And, Maybe exactly. a little bit to that, how that might play with human crews being on the surface. Yeah, so so when you think of a robot, I mean, we sort of, I think of, a lot of us just sort of think of what we've seen sent to Mars before, which is the these uh, rovers, but you could actually imagine a, a whole series of different kinds of, of robots that you might use. Could be uh, aerial drones, you could use uh, just handheld instruments that have um, minimal amounts of automation. Uh, to do that the astronauts would carry with them. Um, or you could have uh, big these big roving robotic laboratories that that trundle up to a, a location of interest and and do a lot of interesting science and sort of sit there for maybe you know a month, you know, chugging away on on a particular outcrop. Um, so so there's sort of a whole different and oh you could even imagine uh, something like a robonaut, which is um, sort of a humanoid robot. So a robot that could could mimic human behavior um, and wouldn't obviously need to be worried about um, the, having to put on a spacesuit or, or stuff like that. Um, all right, I can go to the next slide here. So, so, so there's also a lot of different ways in which the robots might be controlled. Um, and so we talked about um, how they might work together or how they might work separately or work independently. But then you also have the possibility that the astronaut um, could use, could control the robot directly um, from their suit uh, while they're in the field. It could, the robot could be controlled from an astronaut within a habitat. Um, there could be uh, robots controlled from orbit or they could also be controlled from Earth. So. So there's a lot of different um, possibilities on how you control the, the robots, and that would also play into the uh, how you would use them. Um, and uh, you you might have um, a series uh, an episodes where all all of these different kinds of control mechanisms are used um, by the same robot. So so you might have periods where the astronaut wants to control it and then hand that off to an IV uh, a crew member inside the habitat. Or, or then hand it off to scientists at Earth. All right. And the next slide. Uh, well, a quick question on uh, yep. the, the robots that we might send. Uh, if, if they are working closely with, with human explorers, are, are we sending ones with, you know, what, what kind of instrumentation are they going with? Is it the same stuff that we send on Curiosity? Or because we have a human there, are there instruments that we might be able to leave off, or instruments that we might really want, um, just with, with an astronaut there? Yeah, so so th so that's uh, a good question, um, and it sort of gets to the point of what what the robot's task is. Um, so, if the robot's objective, for example, um, one possibility is that you would use robots for um, 
for reconnaissance. So you would be sending the robot out to do reconnaissance of an area in advance of a human exploration um, with the idea that the, the that, that they could identify areas of interest. Um, and in that case, the kind of instruments that you want to include would be uh, instruments that could do remote sensing and um, would allow you to cover a lot of, of, of area. Um, the the prob the, then the other possibility is, is that you want to use this as the use the astronauts for the reconnaissance because humans are pretty good at it um, exploring uh, moving around pretty quickly and also um, analyzing visual data. So um, maybe the astronauts are the best use for reconnaissance, at which point um, then you would want, maybe want a robot that could go and do specialized uh, analytical chemistry on a surface. On a surface. Um, actually, before we go on to this slide, I want to mention another thing, um, and that's the how you deal with the data. So, so one of the things that happens when you start using robots is you start generating a lot of data or even scientific instruments. Um, and, and there's a real big challenge on trying to figure out, trying to use that data effectively. Um, frequently, it's pretty complex. It gets pretty complex very quickly. Um, and we need to work on better mechanisms for um, processing that data, allowing that data to be used in a tactical sense. So ideally, you're able to respond um, tactically or you know, within minutes or hours to the data that you've collected. And, um, and that, that allows you to do more efficient, uh, more efficiently explore the, the area that you're interested in. So you could, you know, based on the measurements that you're making, you could make uh, tactical decisions about where to go next um, and so forth. So, so that's a real challenge and uh, something that we hope, you know, we might be able to be, be able to use uh, artificial intelligence um, and, and then also other visualization tools as well um, within the, the astronaut um, suit. All right, so next slide. You talk to um, humans on the surface uh, interacting with robots. What about uh, humans in orbit interacting with robots on the surface? Is that an interim step where those concepts maybe get flushed out or are there specific things? That yeah, so I think that's my next slide. Is it telepresence in my next slide? Should uh, be. Great. Yeah, so, so exactly. So, so the other idea is that robots can be used to extend the area of exploration. So, so you might be able to um, use these uh, use the robots to go farther than the humans could go. Um, you could launch, you know, hop robots out to an area that you haven't been, um, and the, or else you could uh, explore uh, on the surface when the humans aren't there using sort of telepresence. So if the humans are in orbit, um, they could command robots on the surface. Um, more effectively, with they have a much lower latency, um, take advantage of that low latency um, effect, um, and so that's also something that we we are trying to, to analyze. Because the other possibility is that you might be able to utilize, uh, you might be able to overcome some of the challenges of of the latency effects with uh, better automation. So, um, you know, as we develop these self-driving cars and that kind of thing, we might be able to use those kinds of technologies to drive robots on the surface and just having the fact that you have a robot, I mean, a, an astronaut present to, to drive it maybe isn't so much of an uh, advantage anymore. Um, so, so that's, I mean, these are all things that, that are in the, in the pot and need to be figured out before we send humans back. All right, I think that's my last slide. All right, thank you, Paul, and with thank that, you on to Brian? I think you are. All right. And I will just uh, start off by saying, referring back to Chris's initial statement that the accessing samples and uh, transferring them, bringing them back up is one of the most difficult aspects of this, whether we're accessing subsurface ice or other samples below the surface. And historically, if we go back a little bit, the act of drilling is, um, I sometimes like to bring up a metaphor to my kids or to school groups talking about, well, even if we think we know what's below the surface and we think we know what we're drilling into, we don't really. And we may be surprised. I sort of said, it's like driving Mario Kart. You may know what the track is, but you don't know what those shells are that are going to come skidding across your path. <laughs> and as a result, uh, 
drilling and going down to any depth has been a human activity as much of an art as a, of an art form as a science for the past well, couple of hundred years at least and in the oil and gas industry or even in drill ships scientifically it is a very human tended it is a dynamic changing with a lot of variables and unknowns coming up sometimes fairly rapidly and that has driven deeper drilling to be very uh, human intensive, even if it's been teleoperation, just as we were saying, it could from a nearby, let's say if you're drilling on the seafloor and you're sitting on shore or on a rig somewhere, you're still teleoperating from outside the operations zone. So there are parallels there. However, before putting humans on the surface, we are probably going to want to go do some science and at least assess what the hazards are before the people arrive. And to do that, we need to be able to drill at least some distance below some critical level, let's say a few meters. And so the slide you see is a concept of uh, something that is human operated that might be a later uh, entrant in that, that can go say five to 10 meters. That's what I think it was society, commissioned by the uh, Society of Petroleum Engineers actually 10 years ago. So to wet interest in uh, drilling on Mars among their graduate students and students. So this has been an ongoing debate in terms of uh, trade-offs between planetary protection and microbes and spreading versus the real-time questions and um, operations issues with trying to go deeper. There's probably some threshold below which we almost have to have humans at least teleoperated or in the sort of the same time zone as it were and not trying to operate it uh, with 10 minutes light speed delay back to earth and probably somewhere around five to ten meters i would guess if i were just going to put an arbitrary number out there so going on to the next chart so that's also tied to frequency of drilling because mm -hmm. right? if you're trying to do a lot of it even you've got i mean that, that may exacerbate be equally bad, right? Even if, if you wanted to do a lot of drilling at different locations, the more change and the more variables, the harder it is, even with our existing uh, autonomy. Now, there are other activities that involve real time changes and unpredictability, flying a, an airplane or driving a car in traffic. And we now have robotic technologies and sensors that can anticipate and we're sort of tackling these with uh, drones, UAVs, self-driving cars and the like. And I think we can drill similarly down to some depth without any contact with Earth or with humans. But at some point, it's a hard enough problem with enough unknowns that probably humans are going to be required, as Chris said initially, to enable deep drilling. So. I was going to allude briefly to a study we did about so a little over 10 years ago trying to compare productivity and doing field geology tasks in terms of the number of observations and the number of hypotheses about what they were seeing. We went to a virgin site that had not been seen by the participants at uh, in the Arctic near Houghton Crater, actually about 75 north. And we had a all-terrain vehicle, a quad, that was automated and instrumented and with a Panacam that operated by a science panel back at NASA Ames, you know, 5,000 miles away by satellite with uh, only periodic time delayed updates. And we found that they were very, very focused on navigation and making sure they got to their next selected target and sometimes with missed targets of opportunity. We compared their productivity to we took and borrowed from Hamilton Sunstrand a uh, prototype crew surface Mars suit, at least a circa 2000s Mars suit, put another field geologist in it and sent them out to the same area, not knowing what the others had done to make their own observations. Now, of course, we had safety people trailing behind them in case they got into trouble, since you have to do that with suited tests. But uh, then we later sent a experienced geologist in their shirt sleeves with no hindrances whatsoever and had the, all three comparisons of multiple sites to see what their accounts were. Did they see the same geological story? Did they come up with the same observations and hypotheses? And we also compared just the you know raw number of uh, observations made by each and found that there was about a roughly 50 to 1 ratio between the, the shirt sleeve geologist's productivity to the quote rover productivity with the space suited human being somewhere in between. So 
for doing this kinds of field science, this is sort of an intriguing comparison and kind of plays into the sample acquisition at the same time. I think the last chart sort of shows a little bit of the um, targets of opportunity. It was actually a hand sketch done by one of the grad students basically saying, well, Rover team is focused on navigation going from point A to point B to point C most of the time and not getting lost and not overshooting. And this tends to put the team that's operating the rover almost in a mechanistic time frame, which is kind of an interesting, almost a double reverse backflip rather than the remote robotics uh, taking on a more human approach to studying and doing the field science, the scientist operating the rover come more uh, mechanistic in their decision making and more serially, we do this, we do that, we do the next thing, and less dynamic and less prone to going after targets of opportunity. The, the formation you weren't expecting, the thing that looks like it might be a bit of something growing on something else, uh, an ancient hydrothermal chimney that is sitting just 20 meters off your expected path that you weren't expecting to see there. Whereas the uh, human geologist, either space suited or in shirt sleeve, tended to wander off their expected track and look for these things. So that productivity comparison is one of the reasons I think we have to have both people on the surface doing life detection eventually in some context, once we've been able to scout it robotically. And at the same time, the robotics, as we have it, can take us maybe 10 meters, but probably can't take us a lot. And on that note, I will segue over to Jen. All right. So uh, where are we going to look for life? It doesn't matter if we're talking about a rover or if we're talking about humans. You know, we, if we want to go do due diligence in that search for life, we need to have a better idea of where to go look. So what I'm showing in this first slide is the Pahrump Hills. This is in Gale Crater Mars, uh, where Curiosity Rover has uh, been exploring. And in this site, you can see um, a little bit of outcropping of different rocks popping out. Those rocks, we've studied those already with the Curiosity Rover, and the geologists looking at those images have determined that those are from a lake deposit. Now, on Earth, we associate a lot of life, life with lakes. So for all the same reasons that we associate life with lakes on Earth, we might do the same on Mars. There's water, there's nutrients, there's often chemical gradients. Of course, on Earth, we also have sunlight. On Mars, it could be all sorts of different radiation. Um, everything that organisms would need is likely to be there, and it's going to fluctuate because it's a catchment. Stuff is coming into that lake on a continual basis, and so it's kind of replenishing whatever's there. It's a good place to look. Now, on Mars today, we don't have lakes. But what we do have is an ancient record of those lakes. So in this case, this is one such example where we have a paleo environment that might be a good place to look for ancient signatures of ancient life. Now, on the flip side of that, we'll go to the next slide. Here's a picture from the uh, Phoenix lander up in the, when it landed in the northern plains and it scraped through the regolith and you can see patches of ice showing up. This is a completely different scenario where you might have, we might have uh, ice that is going through different climatic patterns and maybe some of it melts a little bit or maybe it's moving around. Under different weather type conditions, we might actually have microbes in there. Or maybe they're further down where that ice is now water, where they might be living in more or less groundwater. This would be a case where we might look for evidence of extant life, modern life, or maybe I should say recently dead life. <laughs> we don't know which it's going to be, but something certainly more modern than, say, the last scenario, which was about 3 billion years ago. These are two different scenarios. How we go and look for signs of life in both scenarios is very different. But what's very what's clear to astrobiologists is finding places that are a good place to look is important. You can't just go about this kind of search randomly. And so one of the things that we think would happen um, with astronauts on the surface of Mars working with robots, and I go to the next is that 
they'll work together. Um, probably not like this with a rover actually handing off the sample to the astronaut. But uh, they're going to have to work in tandem together to achieve the most effective science. And we've already heard um, from the other folks on the panel here that you, the rovers are capable of doing a lot of different things. We can operate them under different scenarios, and their interaction with humans might be could could be uh, structured differently. But what's important to think here is that rovers might actually be doing the primary sampling of any type of material for the search of life because they're easier to clean and keep clean, and they can go places that we might not want to send humans. So they can go get samples and bring them back to humans to start doing a, a more in-depth triage. So let's go on to the next slide. All right, so here are just a few examples of, of the types of uh, scenarios of analysis that we might expect to astronauts to be engaged in. Let's say, let's say our rovers bring back, they could, might bring back rock cores, ice cores, maybe at rock samples. Maybe they've collected dust from the air. Whatever that might be, they bring that back to the lab and the first thing they would wanna do is have all of our robotic instrumentation, everything that doesn't require a lot of hands-on work, go at it and make a whole bunch of measurements. And I give an example here of a, a hyperspectral imaging of some rock cores that can go through and actually label out, hey, this is where all the minerals are. Now the astronaut can look at that data and say, hey, there's something interesting here. I want to look at that a little more close. So then they can go through and maybe they'll do some um, smaller sampling. It could be robotically done, but guided by the human right there at the same location where we don't have to have a 48 hour or 24 hour delay in communicating the rover information or the robot information back to Earth and then back to Mars. They are right there on the site. So they can look at what the data they have they can choose what they want to do next right away. They can act on that, get new data. And I give the example in the second picture in the middle there of the SAM instrument. The SAM instrument is an um, is instrumentation that is on the Curiosity River now. And it has a mass spectrometer on it. It's just one example of a type of instrument that might look for particular molecules in that sample. Those might be molecules of organisms ancient organisms, recent organisms, or it could be molecules of, of their waste products, their possible food. It could be stuff that's nothing related to life at all. We don't know what it's gonna be. But the point is that there are certain instruments out there that require a little more time to do their analysis. And then lastly, let's say we, we have a clue. Something that's suggesting that, hey, maybe there's something here. Maybe it's extant life and it's actually doing something. What do we do then? Well, the next step would be to get a better look at it. And this is where humans have to be directly involved. We get a microscope out and we put, we look at the materials underneath the microscope. We look to see if they're moving. Do they have any sign of activity whatsoever? Can we look, can we find things that look like cell morphologies? These are the types of things that we might want to do in sort of a later stage in an investigation. But having humans involved enables that at a much faster pace and, and expands our capabilities much more so than we, could, than we could do with just robotics alone. And with that, I'll take questions. So I have one that's come in, and it's a question. Actually, I guess it's really be interesting to see a number of different perspectives on this. This is uh, taking a, having a, an astrobiologist on the crew going to Mars. And, can, and so a number of themes have talked about real-time decision-making and, uh, and, and being able to evaluate opportunities for you know, uh, science on the fly. So can maybe a couple of you guys talk to uh, the role of having the right science, the right science community there? I think that there's a couple things that we have to consider. Um, and I, I'll give the other folks here an opportunity to respond. Uh, first, you have to select the samples. And so uh, having geologists present who understand the different materials that are, are, are being examined, how they're packaged, and what that means in terms of um, the source and the processes that are related to that material. That's very important because it's, it's essential context 
for understanding any type of life signature, if it's there. But for an astrobiologist, astrobiologists are actually interdisciplinary scientists, where you know they each one each one has sort of a core discipline that is something that we really relate to. For me, I'm a geologist, by you know, but I do all sorts of chemistry and biology. You know, it's all in there. But the big thing is that um, by learning the other disciplines, we can communicate with those groups and we can understand the values of it and start integrating those fields together. And so to take an astrobiologist into the field, meaning into uh, on, on to Mars, gives us the opportunity to have one of those people who have already started integrating all of that in all those types of data products and measurements and even the questions themselves together to address something as challenging as is there life on Mars. And Chris, maybe over to Chris McKay and, and, and Paul or anyone else, but any other thoughts to add to what Jen said? Starting with Chris. Yeah, I'll, let me, uh, I'm not muted, yeah. Uh, one point I'll make is that the astronauts, although they're separated from Earth by up to 20 minutes of light time, can still benefit from input from scientists at Earth. So they're not alone. They're not uh, on a distant galaxy far, far away. And so they can send preliminary results. They can send uh, pictures of samples. Uh, and they can get uh, literally hordes of experts on Earth to send them back uh, suggestions, try this, do this. So that's an important part of how we think of the science will be done by humans on Mars, is their ability to talk with other humans. And I know in my own personal work, in fact, Jen Eigenbrod sitting there and me on e either sides of the continent collaborate a lot on many different things and hardly ever see each other. We do it all by email. So it, it, uh, especially once you have a personal rapport with an individual, it can be very effective to work with by uh, email. So I can imagine that crews on Mars will develop partner crews on Earth and professional relations with scientists on Earth that will carry over when they're on Mars and are communicating uh, with the 20 minute time delay. But that's not too much different than the three hours time shift between the East Coast. I'll send Jen an email in the afternoon and she'll respond <laughs> early morning my time. That's okay. Hey, it works. Well, anything to add? I think we're running short of time, Bob. Uh, no, uh, nothing to add. Uh, if we're short on that. I would actually just a uh, quick add that the any crew member going to Mars has to have lots of different skill sets and disciplines, and the multi uh, multi science and multi discipline context of an astrobiologist, as Jen was just saying, probably makes an astrobiologist very well suited to for a spot on the Mars crew. Yeah, I just like to add that um, there there are going to be missions between now and when those kinds of decisions are made, that they're going to reveal new things about Mars that we didn't know before that we had thought of. Uh, and, and that may color the selection process according to what is Mars really like at the level we have when those kinds of decisions are being made. Uh, so I got to sneak in one more question from Van Putzik uh, for Jen. Uh, what are the thoughts about chances of finding life in ice versus in liquid water? Probably you know, the liquid is a lot harder to find, uh, but he thinks it might be a more likely habitat. What are your thoughts? I have to agree. It's probably a more likely habitat. But uh, we know that Mars has been going through obliquity cycles and they're rather dramatic and we can expect that the temperature, um, at least around the equator and the mid latitudes, change dramatically um, over time. And so where we have, where liquid water exists in the subsurface today on Mars may be a good habitat for some life if it has everything it needs to, to be viable and, and metabolized. However, where the ice is today may have been liquid at a at a point in the past, and then it could have refrozen, and and that's a target area for astrobiology study today. Do we find extant life in solid ice on Earth? Yes, we so, most certainly do. There yeah. are uh, there are little nooks and crannies of uh, cracks within the grains of ice, and within those you find particles and you find organisms, and there's actually microfilms of water that they can actually use and get uh, nutrients transported across. Well, there's a recent book by a uh, guy called T.C. Onstar, uh, who basically said that uh, you know everywhere that you've looked on Earth and others, where the sample has not been processed,
processed about 150 degrees C. That has been at least 150 organisms per gram or per mil, depending what it is you're measuring. So life really is everywhere. The rocks as well as you know, yeah. on Earth. On Earth, yes. That's cool. We don't know about Mars yet. <laughs> yeah. Wrap up. Yeah, I, I think that's a great note to end on. Um, you know, and that that'll wrap up today's HLS two hangout. Uh, we'd like to thank all of our presenters for joining us, and uh, we, we encourage our HLS two community to continue the conversation. So, if you have thoughts and ideas on which knowledge gaps we should address uh, next, or any questions that you wanted to follow up on this talk, please contact us at uh, NASA dash Mars dash Exploration Zones um, at mail.nasa.gov. Um, as always, uh, we appreciate your questions, comments, and feedback there as well. Um, and you can find more HLS2 resources, including other presentations, a workshop statements uh, on our website. Uh, and you'll, we hope you'll join us for our next Google Hangout on why how we land affects where we land to be held Wednesday, May 2nd from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern. And uh, Rick, to you for any final words? Uh, no, just a big thanks to everybody here in prep always on this. Thank you. And then thank you to everybody online who's helped us figure it out. Thank you all for joining us. <laughs>